Hey, everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and this is a special emergency podcast. Yes, a bonus emergency podcast. And I'm doing this one alone today, and I'm testing a new format, which is me giving you some quick opinions about what's happening in the market and with technology companies today. I'll talk to you a little bit about Apple absolutely crushing their quarter and why ecosystems and subscriptions are a big part of that and why as a startup company, you need to understand this huge trend, their services business. And I'll talk a little bit about Tesla, the shorts, the longs, and a record quarter. The stock is way up today on Wednesday uh, in the aftermarket and how Elon Musk has proven the credit's wrong. I'm also going to talk a little bit about Twitter and Facebook getting crushed earlier in the week. And last week, both their stocks were off 20%, the biggest loss in the history of the stock market on a dollar basis, over $100 billion in market cap wiped out. Now, that isn't exactly wiped out. Those $100 billion were transferred into cash by somebody. Uh, but yeah, it was a big loss. And I will also share with you my thoughts on how you as a founder can prepare for a down market when we get back on This Week in Startups. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Weebly. Whether you're looking to create a side hustle or your dream job, Weebly can help you get there. Visit weebly.com slash twist for 15% off your first purchase. And LinkedIn. LinkedIn has marketing tools to help you target your customers with precision. For a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit to launch your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash thisweekinstartups. Okay, everybody, uh, on today's emergency pod, I want to talk a little bit about this Apple earnings uh, quarter. It was an amazing quarter for Apple, and I talked about it on CNBC earlier today, but I had so much information and so many thoughts that CNBC, which is awesome for reaching a lot of uh, executives across the world, doesn't allow me to maybe open up for as long as I'd like to about certain topics. So I'm going to just open up my thoughts from earlier today. Everybody is really excited that they had a record quarter in terms of uh, revenue. But one thing is terribly wrong, which is Apple is selling uh, the same number of iPhones. The iPhone business is flattening in terms of new iPhone sales. They sell about $200 million a year. And that's incredible. It prints money. But the ecosystem is not growing. The number of iOS devices out there grows on an absolute basis because people buy new phones. But it's not like every quarter after the last quarter, they sell more iPhones. So it's possible that people are upgrading less. It's possible that people can live with these devices longer. That makes sense. Anecdotally, I see a lot of my friends sticking with their phones for a while. But the average sale price increased to over $700. This is interesting as well. Largely caused, I think, by the iPhone X and maybe people buying Apple Care, which I think is blended into it. If you don't know what Apple Care is, it's a warranty for people dropping their phones and breaking the glass. Essentially, that's the core feature. And if you buy an iPhone 10, let's say, and you spend $190, $199 on Apple Care, you can break your phone twice a year, literally break the glass, and it's only $29 to replace it. So that's pretty amazing, especially for people who like to hold their phones naked, which is to hold your phone without a, a case. But um, it's not helpful to Apple to just make more money per phone. They need to get more phones in the hands of more people in order to drive the piece of the business that people were really excited about today, and rightfully so, which is a services business. What is the services business? The services business at Apple are things like Apple Care, which I think is about a third, subscriptions, right? People subscribing to stuff like com.com or even Netflix, or I think Spotify may or may not have enabled subscriptions to the App Store yet. Um, selling content, iCloud, all of that stuff that Apple will sell you is in services. And they did $9.2 billion, I believe, in services this quarter, which puts them on like a $40 billion run rate. It grew 30% year over year. Why is this important? Well, if you think about it, now Apple has two ways to make money. One is selling you the device, and the second is the services layered on top of it. This is a wonderful ecosystem that they built over time. There's over a billion iOS devices out there between 700, 800, 900 million iPhones out there, plus layer on top of that, uh, the number of iPads and also the watch, arguably as part of the iOS ecosystem. But since it's got to be 
since it's normally tethered, I would just say iPads and iPhones are part of that ecosystem. And people are spending money to do things on those. Uh, and it doesn't seem crazy that people would spend $1,000 on, on a phone. Many of you listening have bought the iPhone 10 and spent 1000 to probably $1,200 on it just for the phone. And when you think about it, if you used it for two or three years... It's somewhere between a dollar and two dollars a day for your phone, and if you sold the phone at the end for three or four hundred dollars, maybe it's eight hundred dollars over two years. Yeah, it's about a dollar a day, maybe a dollar fifty a day. For the amount of value one gets from the phone, I could see that average sale price going way up. But the services revenue, I think, is going to be very compelling because it's high, um, it's a high margin in all likelihood, and. It's sustainable and it's diverse, right? So you could be subscribing to calm.com for meditation. You could be subscribing to Netflix for content or anything in between. And that will um, give Apple revenue for years to come. If there's a billion devices out there and they make, who knows, 40 billion a year, 50 billion a year in the coming year, 60 billion off of those billion devices, you can do the math, maybe three, four dollars per month per device. And I'm guessing only half of the people in that ecosystem use it. So it might be as much as six dollars per month uh, per device. So this is a pretty compelling story. If you don't know about subscriptions, it's something to consider. And you really do want to give Apple that 30 percent in year one. If people renew in the second year. I, my understanding is you only pay 15% for the yearly subscription. So if you if you think about selling a $100 a year product, giving your vendor, the distributor, $30 for year one and $15 for year two, it's $45 of your $200 take. That's less than you would pay to Walmart or some other company that was buying your product and marking it up 100%. So I think it's pretty amazing, uh, their results. And to give you context, you know, in 2007, 2008, when this iPhone came out, you know, they, they sold about a million and a half in the half of the year in 2007, 2008, 12 million, 2017, 217 million. Uh, and they'll definitely, you know, be above 200 million in 2018. So Apple has done a pretty amazing job, but you have to wonder if they're going to be servicing and just pulling out as much money from the top end of the market without ever trying to get the money from, say, the Android market, which is the majority of the market. So it's a it's a mixed bag. Should you own the stock or not? I have no idea. I mean, it's the price earnings ratio seems to have gotten a lot higher. Apple's bought back a lot of stock, which drives that. I do know Apple's going to be here in 10 years because nobody has built a product that is as compelling. I use the Pixel two and i'm using the um i'm using currently a chromebook from google and it is quite compelling i have to say i actually enjoy my pixel 2 and my chromebook as much as i enjoy my apple products and they're cheaper but the iphone still the ecosystem is much more refined the apps are much more refined so people are gonna at the high end stick with apple all right when we get back we'll talk a little bit about tesla Thanks to our friends at Weebly. I just want to give a shout out to them. They've been incredible sponsors for us. If you've ever thought about quitting your job and doing your own thing, you are not crazy. In fact, you're like 82 million other Americans who've said they'd start their own business if they could. Well, Weebly wants to see more of these people take the leap and turn their ideas into successful online businesses. So they've made it really easy to get started first. They make it dead simple to create a great looking website, but more importantly, they provide the tools that you need to help you turn that website into a successful business. So if you were an artist or you were in fashion and you wanted to sell your stuff online, well, how would you do that? Well, with Weebly, you can build an online store that makes your products and your brand look incredible. Then you can do the hardcore stuff like manage your inventory, collect payments, run promotions, and even live chat with visitors on your site. These are all the check boxes that I look for in startups. You want people who can do these kind of um, sophisticated things. And when you're ready to grow, Weebly will help you get discovered on search engines and create marketing campaigns and get those return customers, which are critical. So whether you're looking to create a side hustle or create your dream job, Weebly can help you get there. Visit Weebly.com slash twist for 15% off your first purchase. Weebly.com slash twist for 15% off your first purchase. Weebly is more than just a beautiful website. W-E-E-B-L-Y.com slash twist. Go check them out. 
and we do appreciate them supporting independent media. Okay, welcome back, everybody. As I mentioned a couple of years ago, I did believe that Apple would become the first trillion dollar company. That was back in 2012. I wrote that, and I wrote that payments would be one of the ways they would get there. Uh, subscriptions also seems to be helping, and they're on the cusp of being a billion dollar company. Yeah, it was a it's it was pretty hard to make that call. I think back then it's pretty easy to make the call in the last year or two as they broke 500 billion dollars in market cap. Um, also, um, Apple is probably going to flirt with this trillion dollar valuation up and down over the next year or two. Amazon will probably join them there. What does it mean for startups? It means that they're going to have a ton of money to buy companies, and you will see the Amazons and the Apples of the world buying up larger and larger assets. You saw Whole Foods get purchased by Amazon for $13 billion, and a headphone company got bought by Apple for 2 or $3 billion. I think that's just the start. These companies, even though some of them like to build everything at home, are going to have so many billions and tens of billions and eventually hundreds of billions of dollars in their bank accounts that they're going to either buy back their stock like Apple's doing, or they're going to buy big companies like Amazon and Facebook have done in the past. Let's talk a little bit about Tesla. It's been an up and down ride for them um, in terms of public relations. Obviously, uh, there's a huge short interest, and Tesla has had a hard time with their production hell. When I look at this kind of battle going back and forth between the shorts and the longs and everybody in between, people who believe blindly in Tesla and Elon, uh, and then people who believe the company is just never going to make it work, what I would encourage people to do is just think about how many cars have they actually produced and how many pr cars have they produced historically. Every uh, quarter, they break a new record in the number of cars being delivered. Now, it might not be as fast as people want it to be, um, but the product is so good that the people who buy it are obsessed with it. And over time, and this is an important thing for founders to realize who listen to this program, people are going to criticize you and tell you why it's not going to work. In some cases, those haters are going to have really good justifications um, for why they think you're going to fail. But that doesn't mean that even in the majority case of failure, that you will. The majority case for startups is failure. And for an electric car company 10 years ago, it certainly would have been the case. They only shipped a couple of thousand of the Roadsters, but then they started shipping tens of thousands of the Model S and then the Model X. And now we're looking at them shipping 5,000 cars per week and hundreds of thousands of cars per year. The stock is up massively in the after hours, I think 10% at the time I'm recording this. But there are some things uh, that you can look at here that are important for founders to understand. The first is uh, stay focused. If you look at Elon, he's getting attacked from all different sides, and I think he's engaged the haters. Probably a mistake. You can do that to a certain extent, but um, over time, if you jump into the mud pit the, with a pig, as they say here in Silicon Valley, um, the pig will enjoy it. You'll both get covered in mud, and from a distance, people can't tell who the pig is and who the human is. And so I think that's what's happening is people on the internet with these anonymous accounts with Twitter are very apt to make 50 accounts, 20 accounts. And so if you look at the world uh, on Twitter, and that's your lens, it's completely toxic. Every time I get off of CNBC, if I mention something nice about a company like, say, um, Tesla, or I said something I didn't like about Facebook's behavior with the Russian um, interference and selling ads to the Russians that were pretty loathsome, you will have 20 accounts then come and harass you, tell you you're stupid, tell you you're ugly, tell you you're fat, whatever it is. And you look at those accounts and they're specifically designed to harass people. They only have a half dozen followers or one follower. They've only existed for 10 tweets. And so Twitter will give you a false sense of what's going on in the world. It's important that people don't engage with these haters. And this is the reason why Twitter, in a related story, got crushed. I think they were down 20% as well. Um, and their revenue was doing okay, but they finally purged all of these bad accounts. And so what did Wall Street do? They, they gave them a haircut. They took 20% off the stock. That was the right thing for Twitter to do. In fact, that's what Twitter should have done all along. They shouldn't have had this anonymous toxic toxicity in the system. Anybody can reply to anybody. 
that is charming and it was amazing in the early days of Twitter when you could talk to Howard Dean or Obama or Ashton Kutcher. It was like mind blowing that you could be in a thread with Ashton Kutcher. It was like Ashton Kutcher showing up uh, for a or Obama showing up for an AMA on Reddit. It was a very unique experience. And it was like every day, that famous person is on Twitter. However, when you allow anonymous accounts and people have an ax to grind, whether it's somebody you fired or somebody you beat in the marketplace or somebody who has a short interest against you, it becomes quickly toxic. And so there is a very easy way for Twitter to solve this. I don't know why they haven't solved it. I think they're largely incompetent over there when it comes to product, to be honest. Um, they just move very slow and they make very bad decisions. I wrote a piece maybe a year and a half ago where I said it'd be very easy to uh, handle the freedom of speech issue, which is when somebody writes something offensive or it gets reported as offensive, just blur it out and tell people, um, this is potentially offensive. Click here to show this tweet. And so people who are snowflakes, who don't want to be harassed online, or who don't want a difference of opinion, uh, or who don't want salty language, they would be protected. And in the case of somebody who really was genuinely harassing a person, um, you wouldn't have to see it. And it would be at the bottom of your feed. They actually did that exact feature that I suggested. Jack actually reached out to me and said, great idea. I'm going to work on it. So they actually did that one. Well, here's the next feature, um, more free product of dice um, for the Twitter team. When I tweet, put a box, a checkbox under my tweet, only allow people I follow to comment. Then another checkbox, only allow people who follow me to reply. Now you would have a semi- private experience. It wouldn't be private in that the feed was private. You could still be public. But what comes under your tweet would be limited to people who you follow, which is a small subset, right? I may follow a couple thousand people, a couple hundred people, or the people who follow you. And if you block people, they're not following you anymore. So the people you've blocked would not be allowed in there. If they did that, then every time Elon tweets, he could just say, or every time... Uh, Leslie Jones were to tweet she was harassed horrifically by Milo Yiannopoulos on the service. They could just, she could just say, I don't want to see their tweets underneath mine. And the proximity of the hate to the person creates this psychological stress. That's why I deleted Twitter from my phone again. Last time I deleted Twitter from my phone, I was able to finish my book. Now I've deleted it. I'm able to do more podcasts, have clear thinking, sleep better at night. I was going to bed searching for Mueller, waking up searching for my name or the podcast. And it was just making me a bit manic. And you don't sleep well. Well, I think that's what happened to Elon and many other people who've gotten down the Twitter rabbit hole. It's a lot of fun. It's intellectually stimulating. But at the end of the day, you're fighting with people anonymous accounts, sometimes dozens of which are being run by the same person. All that matters with a company like Tesla is the product and delighting users. Everything else will be worked out. Sure, they have a lot of debt, but there's tons of capital in the world. At any point in time, Tesla could raise more money. At any point in time, Tesla could take down a big investment from Masayoshi-san, who put $10 billion into Uber. They could take down money from Sequoia's new growth fund. I think they have $8 billion under management. They could take money from any private equity firm. They could take money from Google or Apple or Amazon, who all want in on what Tesla is building. So the shorts, I think, are crazy. It's their right to short the company. It's not their right to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which is what they're doing uh, and sometimes lying. But you have to deal with the public. And I think Tesla is doing a good job of getting focused now on what matters the quality of the cars, and how delighted their customers are. When we get back, I want to talk about how you can prepare for an eventual downturn. Stick with us. Hey, everybody. I want to tell you a little bit about LinkedIn's advertising program. Yes, you can go on LinkedIn and find high-quality leads, get website traffic, and build your brand awareness. The first step is talking to the right audience and the right audience is on LinkedIn. Over 500 million professionals engage with content on LinkedIn every day, and your future customers are among them. LinkedIn has marketing tools built in that let you target your customers with precision down to their job title. So if you wanted the VP of sales or the VP of marketing or the CTO or the data scientist, 
you can look for those specific titles and you can market to them and within specific industries and obviously geographic locations. This lets you create a better message that your customers care about. Maybe your product is bought by people in HR, but sometimes the CEO, CEO or COO make the decision. So you could advertise a different message to those three different constituents all on LinkedIn. In fact, four out of five customers on LinkedIn are decision makers at their company. You know this because you're a decision maker and you're on LinkedIn. So you're building relationships that really matter. And here is your call to action. You can redeem a $100 LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign right now. LinkedIn.com slash This Week in Startups. That URL again, LinkedIn.com slash This Week in Startups for your $100 free ad credit terms and conditions apply. But it's well worth typing in all those characters. LinkedIn.com slash This Week in Startups. Okay, let's get back to the news. Hey everybody, it's your pal Jason. If you ever want to email me a question or you want to email me about your startup, I'm an angel investor. I like getting email. Jason at calacanis.com. Jason at calacanis.com is my email. If you email me, you're going to get a bounced message that says, oh, this email gets 500 emails a day. I'm super important. Um, but I read all of them. I just put that out there in case uh, people are offended that I don't get back to them immediately. But I do read all those emails eventually. I'm going to be going to Tokyo in September. Just want to let folks know I'll be there from the 14th to the 21st. And they've translated my book into Japanese. Thank you so much uh, for doing that. And I'll be there in support of the book, which apparently got to number one in the business charts briefly in uh, on Amazon. And they sold out and they're doing another printing of 15,000. So I'm big in Japan, as they say in the business. I sent an email to the 250 founders I've invested in across over 150 companies just two weeks ago. In fact, I sent it maybe four days before Facebook lost $100 billion in market cap. Now, when you say they lost $100 billion, they didn't lose $100 billion. People sold their shares. Other people bought them at a lower price. And then those people got cash back. So it's not like $100 billion was burned in a fire. Just people chose to not pay as much for Facebook, but it is telling. And the reason people, I think, got out of that stock uh, in a big way was because, well, they, they think there, there are reputation issues, and those reputation issues are now hitting the balance sheet because they said that their expenses trying to combat fake news and put in more privacy controls, the expenses associated with that are going to be greater than the revenue growth. That's not a good look for a public company that's already printing money. Now, I don't believe that Facebook's going anywhere. But I do believe that what we saw with Twitter and Facebook losing 20% was a very important moment for the stock market. As you know, in the stock market, 20% is considered a correction and a crash would be more than 20%. I believe that's how most people define it. I know there's been some debate around this. We're in a bull market. Um, that is the longest since World War II, is my understanding, and it's year 10. Now, some people will debate if it's a 10-year bull market because there were one or two corrections where the stock market lost 19 or 21 percent, So, but it came right back. So if you're a purist, maybe it hasn't been a perfect 10-year bull market, but it has been quite a spectacular run-up since the Dow and the NASDAQ got cut in half uh, after the Great Recession. And we're seeing a lot of chaos in the world, not to make this political, but when Trump starts threatening tariffs, when um, there's global instability, when there's a chance at um, a president being indicted or impeached, when there's this level of chaos in the world, there can be something that happens called a contagion. One bad piece of news leads to another p bad piece of news and the whole market just gets flushed. How do I know this? I lived through it. The dot-com era, the dot-com bust was brutal. After 9-11, it was brutal to uh, obviously be a New Yorker and watch so many uh, fellow New Yorkers die and the poor people on the plane um, headed to uh, the Pentagon and in the field on the way there as well to D.C. and all the pilots and flight attendants on those planes. And after that, we had another stock market crash. And these things lead to um, serious chaos for founders. So, and we actually had it again, obviously, with the contagion around the real estate market. If you look at three of those, those three specific crashes, 
two of them were called by caused by financial manipulation on Wall Street. The dot com era, you know, these companies should have never gone public. People knew they were weak companies. They were raising too much money. I would say I'll, that was primarily on the laps of the uh, and the desks of the stock market and the and the banks who took these companies public, but also obviously the founders and venture capitalists who participated also are partially to blame. And in the real estate market, when that collapsed, obviously people were doing all kinds of fugazi crazy stuff. For startups, it's important for you to know that great companies are built during the down market. Let me say that again. Fortunes are built in a down market. They're collected in the up market. So I invested in Uber in 2008. And you might have read that you can sell some shares in Uber to Masayoshi-san and other people over time. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Or maybe it goes public next year. The market then peaks and people are able to get some liquidity. Uh, you saw that with Google investors, Facebook investors, Twitter investors over the years. So a down market is not bad for startups, but if you're not ready for it and you have a massive cost basis, you will blow out during a down market. I've seen this firsthand. After the dot-com bust, so many people got taken down because they had too much office space and they had leases that killed their companies. Thankfully, today, people do things like use office suites and desk sharing and rent to desk so they don't have these long leases that could crush the companies. In fact, when I was in the conference business, Red Herring, Industry Standard, and Upside, all three of those companies went out of business, I believe, and I, I got to see the inside on two of those three, because they had massive contracts with conferences where they had booked at the Ritz Laguna, Nagal, and Four Seasons, they had booked you know, 20 dates in advance where they had promised 100 hotel rooms a night. It was millions of dollars in liability. And those companies, when the stock market crashes, then immediately file to get that money from you because they know that whoever files first to get it from you has a greater chance of getting it. So how do you prepare for this kind of collapse? Or should you even bother since it's out of your control and nobody can predict it? I'm not saying there's going to be a, a crash. In fact, the majority case is there's not going to be a crash. There's just going to be corrections as we go. And hopefully... There's no shenanigans or weird stuff going on that we're not aware of, like the dot-com bust or, and we knew about the dot-com bust. Everybody knew everything was overinflated. Here, it's hard to tell if a Netflix, Amazon, or Apple are overinflated. We know that they're at high PE ratios, but these are real businesses that are printing money and have war chests and are buying back their shares. So it's not as black and white as it was in the dot-com era. And certainly, you know, we don't see the financial irregularities that we saw with something like... Uh, the great real estate bust of 2007, 2008, the Great Recession. If the stock market crashes, not corrects, but crashes, and I'll call that an event, um, all the stocks sell off, right? So rich people all of a sudden feel poor. And there's usually a couple of head fakes in there, like the market goes down 20%, then it comes back 5%, then it goes down another 10%, then it comes back 2%. You have this like whole situation where people are not accepting it. Some people are buying into it. But anyway, then there's a flight to quality. And what happens is venture capitalists realize if they make a capital call to their limited partners, if those limited partners are getting crushed in the stock market, they may not have the money to make that capital call. Or it might be considered in poor taste to ask your LPs, your limited partners as a venture firm, to give you the money. They might say, you know what? No capital calls for six months or a year. Give us a break here. And that's what happened during the Great Recession. If that happens, then the VCs are left to look at their portfolio and say, what's the top third? We're going to focus on them. What's the bottom third? We're going to cut bait with them. If they want to buy their shares back, but we're going to get off the boards, we're going to stop working on them. And the ones in the middle, we'll do the best we can to be supportive, and you know, but we're probably not going to put more money into them. A flight to quality. So you have to ask yourself as a startup founder, are you in the top third? the middle third or the bottom third of your investor's portfolio, if you're not in the top third or top 10 or 20%, you are not going to be able to raise funding, which means you have to get profitable on the money you have. And in a lot of cases, that's not possible. So you should be looking at this right now and understand that seed rounds and continued financing is going to go down. And additionally, if you are able to raise money, the investors will say to you, great, we want to do a down round. Great. We'll, we'll put another $2 million in. We'll put that $2 million on. We want a 3x liquidation preference. So we want $6 million back when we sell. And then if that 
that two million bought twenty percent. We're going to want that twenty percent as well. And all of a sudden, a, a sale for fifteen or twenty million that looks really good, all of a sudden looks really bad with the investors getting half the money. Uh, it's called a liquidation preference. You can look it up. We haven't had one in Silicon Valley in a decade. And what you need to do worth, and then it takes probably you know three to six months for a crash type situation to start to work itself out. Sometimes it takes nine or twelve, but the seed market. The rich people investing in small companies, seed funds investing in small company, venture capitalists, that tends to be 12, 18, 24 months after the crash. So let me say that again. The stock market may start to recover in 6 to 12 months, but the, the market for private companies will lag that, and it will be maybe 9 to 24 months before people start feeling more confident to taking on these high-risk assets. You can tell we're in a bit of a bubble right now, or people are chasing returns when they invest in things like Bitcoin that has no fundamental value, nobody's controlling it, and it's complete greed, and they're buying ICOs from idiots who have never run a company before who can barely write a white paper without spelling errors. So we are in a peak greed period, and when you lose all your money as a rich person, a high net worth individual, all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I have to stop the bleeding. I got to get rid of my second house. I got to get rid of this NetJets card. I got to figure out a way to balance my budget. And instead of going to Europe for a month, I'm going to go to San Diego. Like people, and then the people who go to San Diego say, I'm going to stay home, you know, right? Or I'm going to go to Jersey. So it all trickles down. And then everybody gets their balance sheets in order and then they can start building up. Your company will go out of business in that amount of time. So here's what you should do. You should raise money from good or great investors, if you can, at okay to great prices and have 18 to 36 months of capital in your bank account. So if you're burning, let's say, $50,000 a month, if you were to raise $1.5 million, that would last you for you know, 30 months. If you last 30 months, you're going to make it way through that 9 to 24 month period I told you about. Well, you know what's going to happen when you deploy that capital? You're going to be able to hire people who've been laid off by these other terrible companies that never made it. They're not going to have the same salary expectations. They may take a salary pay cut. A lot of people after the dot-com bust couldn't get work. Developers in Silicon Valley could not get work. You couldn't rent apartments. If you were a landlord, you couldn't find anybody to rent your apartment. Rents went down. Office space hit the rock bottom. People were begging people to rent space. This does happen. And so you're going to, and if you think about deploying marketing dollars, right now it's massively competitive to buy Facebook clicks, to buy Twitter clicks, et cetera, uh, or Google clicks. That's all going to go down to half price. Well, if you can hire your employees for a third less, you can spend half as much on marketing. Wow. Can you imagine what that would be like right now? Imagine if you're in a business right now where you're spending $10,000 a day on advertising. Imagine if he got you $15,000, how that would change your economics. What if hiring that next account executive, because there were hundreds of them on the streets of New York and Arizona looking for work because people laid off, uh, got laid off, you might be able to get them for 20% less. That means every fifth one is for free, right? You're getting, you buy, uh, hire four, get one free. This would make you much more efficient. Now, is this going to happen? Nobody knows. I'm not sitting here like Nostradamus telling you this is going to happen. Nobody can know. But what you can know is when things are frothy and peaking, feels like we're at a peak, I don't think we're going to crash. I think we're going to go sideways. I think it's 20% chance of a crash, 100% chance of continued corrections as things get overheated. Could be 10 years of sideways, moderately up, moderately down. That's probably the likely scenario when I talk to folks. But you should be prepared. That's my message to founders. And you should also be looking and saying, why am I not in the top third of my um, investor's portfolio. The reason is probably you're not printing money, you haven't figured out a repeatable mo a model. So anytime you see something like Facebook losing the leading one of the leading companies in our space, one of the members of FANG, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Netflix, Google, that really uh, sought after cohort, if one of the FANGs loses 20% in a day and $100 billion gets wiped out, you need to take stock. And that's all I'm asking you to do if you want to read the piece I wrote. It's called, This is Your Captain Speaking. I'm turning on the fasten seatbelt sign, uh, just in case there are bumps. And uh, you can see uh, that piece at calacanis.com, my podcast. Thank you for tuning in. 